it's not often you get your hands on a police file. But that's exactly what happened with this case, the missing persons case of Sandra Jacobson and her five-year-old son, John. They went missing in November of 1996 in Bismarck, North Dakota. In most missing person cases that have gone cold, reporters turn to law enforcement and sources close to the missing to try and figure out what happened. What law enforcement tells us is up to them. Sometimes there's information that, if made public, could jeopardize the case. But ultimately, what they tell reporters and the public is their call. That's why this story is different. With access to the police file, we thought we would be telling a more complete story of what could have happened to Sandra and John Jacobson. Instead, we discovered a different story, one focused on an investigation that was filled with holes, holes big enough to warrant examination. That happened in 2004 when the case was picked up by a new detective. While the file does not indicate a guilty party, it does pose the question, did the Bismarck Police Department's initial investigation into the disappearance of Sandra and John thoroughly examine all possible angles? In this series, we'll look at the initial investigation, the questions that went unanswered, potential suspects that were cut loose, and key evidence that went unexamined. You're listening to The Vault, a forum communications podcast covering true crime and general intrigue in the Upper Midwest. I'm Trisha Terinskis. My original reporting on this story can be found at inforum.com. Just look for The Vault section. That's also where you can find images related to this case from the original police file. Sergeant William Connor's phone rang on the afternoon of June 2, 2004. On the other end was a representative from the Missing and Exploited Children's Center. They believed they may have had a hit, a clue, on a 1996 missing persons case from his area. It concerned the case of Sandra Jacobson, who on the evening of November 16, 1996, left her parents' Bismarck home, along with her five-year-old son, to get gas. The missing and exploited Children's Center representative told Connor that there was a person named Sandra Jacobson living in Mandan, a town located just outside of Bismarck. While the hit turned out to be a dead end, it began a years-long quest by Connor to re-examine the investigation. Here's the story. On the morning of Sunday, November 17, 1996, Bismarck police officers discovered a gray 1990 Honda Civic parked alongside the Missouri River in Centennial Park, its driver's side door cranked wide open. With high winds and temperatures well below freezing, an open door was assigned to law enforcement officers that something wasn't quite right. They were correct. Officers discovered the keys in the ignition and a purse sitting on the passenger seat and a checkbook that showed her last transaction had been made the day before at a local gas station. Their efforts to search the area for the driver came up short. A light dusting of snow had fallen the night before and along with it erased any hope for footprints. Detective Tim Turnbull walked in the doors of the Bismarck Police Department on the morning of Monday, November 18th, and was greeted with a missing persons report that had been filed over the weekend. In the report, he learned that a mother and son from Center, North Dakota, had been reported missing. Bernice Grensteiner, Sandra's mother, had told the Bismarck Police Department that her daughter was having mental health issues when she left the evening of November 16th 
to run out for gas. She hadn't heard from her daughter or grandson since. There was something else in the report that stood out to Turnbull. A woman who identified herself as Sandra Jacobson had called the Bismarck Police Department hours before she went missing. She claimed a loved one was in danger at the hands of a satanic cult. That set off a train of thought for Turnbull, who assumed a distraught and mentally ill woman had snapped, leading her down a dark path that ended in the frigid waters of the Missouri River, her five-year-old boy in tow. Right away that morning, he called up the Burley County Sheriff's Office and asked them to start searching the river. The investigation into the disappearance, led by Turnbull, had officially begun. Later that day, Turnbull met with Sandra's husband, Alan Jacobson, who arrived at the police station fresh off a flight from a business trip in Missouri. He had been told the day before that his wife and son had been reported missing. What Turnbull didn't know when Alan walked into his office on November 18th was that things had been rocky for the couple. At the time of the disappearance, Sandra and Alan were in the midst of a separation. Their five-year-old son, John, was living with Sandra in Center, located 40 miles outside of Bismarck. In multiple interviews conducted by investigators throughout the years, her parents, relatives, and close friends said Sandra believed she was days away from a divorce when she went missing, a process she claimed was being handled by her soon-to-be ex-husband, Alan. Subsequent investigations would reveal no evidence of the initiation of a divorce process. Alan never mentioned the divorce to Turnbull, either. Instead, Turnbull listened as Alan told him he and his wife were separated. Although they lived apart, he told Turnbull that he had been recently having trouble with his wife. He said it was fueled by what he referred to as conspiracy theories that he was having affairs. According to the police file, he claimed those allegations were totally off the wall. Alan went on to paint the picture of an unstable woman with periodic religious obsessions. At one point, he told the detective that his wife appeared glossy-eyed during a visit to his home the week before her disappearance. Here's what Turnbull wrote in the report. He stated she got real excited and was shaking and tried to get up and leave, and he grabbed her and sat her down and stayed with her until she calmed down. Alan told the detective his wife called him at around 6.15 in the morning on November 16th, the last day she was heard from, and told him to pray for their son. Specifically, he said she requested he recite the Lord's Prayer. Considering Alan had just flown in from Missouri, Turnbull asked him how long he had been away. Alan said he left the morning of November 16th and returned that day, November 18th just prior to arriving at the police station. That was, somehow, good enough for Turnbull. It wasn't, however, good enough for his superiors. On December 30th, more than one month after Sandra and John went missing, Turnbull met with Lieutenant Myron Hindley and Sergeant Nick Sievert regarding the case. They were concerned that Alan's alibi hadn't been properly vetted, and they came up with a new plan. On that same day, Turnbull reached out to Alan to go over the details of his November work trip. Documents in the police file show that Alan claimed he left North Dakota on November 16th, a Saturday, at around 8 a.m., and rode with six other people in a van to Missouri. This is what Turnbull wrote in the follow-up report. Quote, He stated he got to the hotel room on that Sunday, 11-17-96. Turnbull followed through with calling the Westport Hotel, where Alan said he stayed. He confirmed with the manager that Alan had stayed for one night, November 17, 1996. Turnbull did request that the manager fax a copy of the records to the Bismarck Police Department, but he was informed that it was against company policy to do so without a subpoena. Yes. I did say that he checked with the hotel to make sure Alan had stayed there, and the hotel manager told him he stayed there for one night, November 17th. 
That leaves the question, where was he on November 16th, the night Sandra and John went missing? According to the police file, Turnbull did not obtain information as to where Allen was staying the night of November 16th, the evening Sandra and John went missing, at least not right then. On January 7th, Turnbull received a handwritten letter from Allen's co-worker, who wrote that the two drove together to St. Joseph, Missouri on November 16th, where they stayed the night. The co-worker wrote they then traveled to St. Louis on Sunday, where they spent the evening sightseeing before returning to the hotel, the same hotel Turnbull had called. As far as the police file shows, Turnbull did not follow up with the co-worker who wrote the letter. Questions as to where Allen stayed the evening of November 16th? They went unquestioned and unanswered. On the day Sander's car was discovered, it was taken to the Bismarck Police Department for documentation. Yet with no foul play suspected, the vehicle was not fingerprinted. It was a move that frustrated those close to Sandra, who met with the Bismarck Police Department on December 27th, seeking answers. Here's what then Bismarck Police Sergeant Sievert wrote in his follow-up report. Quote, I told them that even if we found a set of prints that did not belong to Alan or Sandy, we would need a suspect to match them to, and at this time, there are no suspects. End quote. That was difficult for Sandra's loved ones to handle. They were aware that a close family member who received a phone call from Sandra the day she went missing had told investigators on November 26th that they suspected there could have been a third party in the vehicle. There was something else that didn't sit well with them. In the days after the disappearance, Alan entered Sandra's home and allegedly took a number of items. They wondered why law enforcement had allowed them to do that. The answer? They were married. It was his property too. That same reasoning was used when Sandra's purse was released to Alan on November 27th. And again on December 23rd, when he drove the 1990 Honda Civic off the Bismarck Police Department lot. Interviews with those close to Sandra continued to be conducted in the months following her disappearance, but investigators focused heavily on searching the Missouri River. The North Dakota National Guard was called in multiple times to search from the skies, while dive teams did their best to navigate the frigid waters. A child's shoe was found near the river in Centennial Park on May 20, 1997. That gave investigators hope that it could belong to John. Alan told Turnbull at the time that he believed the shoe could belong to his son, but John's older brother and grandmother adamantly said the shoe wasn't his. It was far too large. In the spring of 1997, with the water opening up, Turnbull made efforts through local media to alert boaters to be on the lookout, specifically for anything that could point them to the discovery of Sandra and John. Ultimately, nothing turned up. More than 25 years later, nothing still has. Throughout the years, investigators received phone calls from those claiming to have seen the mother and son. All leads were thoroughly investigated. In the end, they all amounted to cases of mistaken identity. On February 23rd, 1999, Turnbull declared the case inactive. There are no further leads in this case, he wrote in his report. The case will be filed until something further comes up. In part two of this series, we will look at what Connor discovered, and we'll hear from Detective Turnbull and Connor themselves. Hello? Hi, is this Tim Turnbull? Speaking. You've been listening to The Vault, 
a forum communications podcast covering true crime and general intrigue from the upper Midwest. Unlock more cold cases and crimes from the past at inforum.news slash try. Get your first three months of unlimited access to our entire news network for only 99 cents a month. Visit inforum.news slash try to take advantage of this deal. Forum Communications is proud to be part of The Trust Project. Learn more at thetrustproject.org.